friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And today that I'm shooting this is August 3rd and it's going to be one of those videos I'm going to try to get out right away, which means some of my other videos get pushed out even farther. So for those of you who are new, I try to stay two to three weeks ahead on my videos just in case anything big happens or I'm just plain too busy to shoot videos. If I have a bank built up, it keeps me uh, from getting too stressed out about it. So anyway, what that means is some of my other videos could be out at least a month or more before you see them because I try to get the ones I believe are most pertinent to the time out as uh, as soon as I can, such as garden updates and anything to do with preserving foods that may be coming in fresh from your garden right now. Now also keep in mind that I am in the Pacific Northwest on the peninsula of Washington State. We're in a very rainy area and a lot of the things that we grow are much further behind than your more southern and warmer states. The things I've been preserving this week are my green beans. They've just started coming in uh, pretty regular. I usually pick even with as little plants as I have this year that survived the weird, weird cold spring and early summer, I'm still up to picking about a pint of beans or more per day. And one of the reasons I really like the runner beans is that when I pick them young, they make a great green bean. And then when I allow them to finish out, they'll get about this long and this wide, a lot of them. And then I will save them for a dry, dry bean that works really great in chilies and soups. And of course, for seed for planting more beans next year. Right here I have my first small batch of green beans and the reason I did a small batch right now was because last week, and you might have seen this in a community post, I was pulling out some chickens, some whole chickens that we had stocked up on every time they go on sale, the organic free range chickens on sale for $2 off, we stock up on all we can get and put them in the freezer. Well, I've been trying to make more room in my freezer, so I pulled out three days in a row another chicken whole chicken and I would bake it up in our solar oven and then you know since we were finally getting some sunny days and then I was I would make a meal out of it one night and then take the rest of it all off the bones or most of it off the bones the meat and then dehydrated it up to put to vacuum seal into jars. Now I already shot a this and that video where I go into detail how I do this, but I'll talk a little bit about it in here as well for those who want this information now and don't wanna wait the next two weeks until that this and that video comes out. But anyway, so I dehydrated it up and here's an interesting fact you might wanna know that I didn't think to say in that video is that a couple of these jars hold at least a half of a chicken the meat from at least half a chicken and one of the other ones is three quarters of a chicken simply because i'm thinking the one that has about three quarters of a chicken in it it was just a smaller bird where the other ones were a little bit bigger so this was previously cooked so like i said i baked it in the solar oven we would eat on it or patrick would because i don't eat dinner so i'd make him dinner out of it for one night to strip off the meat dehydrate it and jar it up and then to take the bones and make a broth. And so because of that, normally what I'll do is I'll just make a soup right away when I bake a chicken and do all that. And I'll make the meat from the chicken last for several different types of meals. And we can eat on a whole chicken for at least a week because of that. And then the last thing I do is take the bones and make soup out of it. But this time, because I'm trying to, I was trying to work through three chickens at a time, I was able to make a lot of bone broth. I went ahead and made soup out of it using some dehydrated vegetables, just throwing them in there. I do have a recipe showing how I use different dehydrated herbs and vegetables to make and the bone broth to make a soup. It's like one of the easiest ways to use up your dehydrated vegetables. And I will go ahead and link to that video down below. But basically that's what I did here. Once the bone broth was finished, I threw in my spices, my herbs, my dehydrated vegetables, and then just canned them. I just put it right into the jars like that. I didn't wait for the vegetables to cook and rehydrate because I knew in the canning process they would rehydrate just fine. And so what I have are nine pints of chicken vegetable soup, though I did throw some dehydrated potatoes in there. If I wanna add rice or noodles to that, that's something I can do later when I pull the jar out. I don't like doing a whole lot of uh, jarred meals, but I'll do 
chili and now I'll have the soup and what those are for are those days where life just gets too busy or I just simply forget to pull something out of the freezer and then uh, I have something that I can uh, just put in a pan and heat up for Patrick easy enough for him to have dinner that night. Anyway, I ended up with nine pints and then figured I might as well go ahead to finish to top off my canner because I can fit 16 wide mouth pint jars into my canner at a time. I then went ahead and did seven pints of green beans. Now I'll be canning some more green beans and I'm going to show you what I do to get them ready for canning. As the beans are coming in, what I'll do is I'll pick them and just keep each day until I got enough to fill up my whole canner. But here's what I do as soon as I pick them. So I'll have my canning jar ready and I simply take them one bean at a time and break them into uh, halves or thirds. If they happen to be really long, then I'll break them into quarters. Now, if this little tip bothers you because you don't like the way it looks, you can just snap that off too, but I usually don't bother. and I really never bother other than for demonstration. I just break them up and I just keep doing this until my jar is full. And also you may want to, if you have a top on there, you might want to break that part off. Okay, here's, here's a little top. I usually break those off or uh, pinch them off because they can be a little tough. It's not going to hurt you to leave it on there. They just can be a little tough. Where this part here, this part here is totally tender. So anyway, I don't uh, usually wash these beans because they're, in fact, it just, it's been, it rained last night, so they're nice and clean. I'm not worried about it. So I always grow runner and pole beans. Every now and then I'll try to do bush beans. Okay, now I'm going to push that down there. But pole beans, runner beans always do better for us. Okay, so that looks pretty good like that. And this was a brand new jar, but I'm saving these for other things. I like to use my Tatler lids for fruits and vegetables. So I'm just going to put that on there. I'm not worried about if it's the right tightness for it right now because I'm not going to can it yet. I'm just going to put this in my refrigerator for now as is until I have a total of 16 jars or something else that I'm going to can with them if I don't want to do a, another full load of just beans. And usually I get enough within a week and that's about the time you want to do that. Uh, where are these sit in the refrigerator tends to stay much colder anyway. Some people will freeze them. I prefer not to. So uh, they will keep though just fine in there. I've, I've had them sit in there for up to a week with no problem whatsoever before canning them. So then when I go to can them, I'll add about a half of a teaspoon uh, directly to the jar of salt. You can totally admit that. I like to use the either Redmond Real Salt or the pink Himalayan salt. Now put that in there and then I will top it off with room temperature filtered rainwater. You can use whatever healthy water you got or any water that you're able to use, but uh, I like to use room temperature. If you're going to use it straight from the tap, I recommend that you set it on warm, not hot, but warm. And so that you can kind of help uh, bring up the temperature of the jar and the beans themselves. So, uh, but not hot. You don't want to put boiling hot water in there if your jar is still cold. So this to me is one of the simplest methods ever. So I just take my jug of water, I top it off, and then I put lids on. So when you're using a Tatler lid, you just you just set your, make sure your rubber ring is, this is a one that's been used before. You can tell because of the darker color. Put your rubber ring on there and then set it on. Make sure, obviously, you're going to make sure that your rim and the lid and everything is clean and dry. I always rinse this off really good before I put it on there. And then when I go to put the band on, I don't hold it with the other hand. I just put the band on and I only, got to make sure you catch the threads right, and then I only turn it until the jar starts to turn like that. So as long as the jar is turning freely, you don't want to ever put it on any tighter than that. You don't want to do like this like you normally would with a metal lid. You just do it like that. All right, so I'm going to go put this in my fridge. Anyway, these are, every time I go out to collect anything, which is some of the stuff you saw me picking off the beans. It wasn't dirt. It was just pieces from the pineapple weed. So I'm picking uh, the pineapple uh, weed seed heads 
and they just smell so wonderful. I love the smell of them. I love the taste of them. But my uh, what I'm doing with these is I'm saving them for seed to put up on our store. So hopefully in a month, maybe two months, I'll be able to, I'll have these listed. It just depends on how long it takes them to fully dry. And then I get the time to get them packaged up and get them on the store. All right, now let me go ahead and talk about the dehydrated chicken. As I said, I simply take the, pull all the meat off of the chicken, making sure I don't have any bones and gristle and anything like that. The bones obviously go back into the pan to make the uh, bone broth. I add rainwater to it and then put it in the solar oven and I let it bake in the solar oven for two days. But then I, again, and then all the gristly parts I feed to the dog. He loves the gristly parts and they're really healthy for him. So anyway, then I take the meat and I just lay it directly on the fabric covers that I made to go in my Nesco dehydrator. If you've got an Excalibur where you've got the square ones, I still recommend making some fabric covers to go over that. And I have a video on that that I will link to in the description box down below. But what that will do, especially with chicken, is it tends to want to flake up kind of small and you'll have teeny tiny pieces, especially when it's all dried and it gets very, very crispy, that will want to fall through there. Well, putting that cloth down there, yes, you can use a fruit roll-up tray, but those of you who are trying to get away from the plastics as much as possible, a, a nice piece of cotton cut to fit is great and I am loving my cloth covers. They've been working great for everything I've been doing so far, even dehydrating peaches. So anyway, the I just put the meat right on there. I don't bother to rinse it off. Yes, there's gonna be a little bit of fat in there. It's not as bad as your ground beef, but I didn't bother to rinse it off. I just pulled it off of the bones, put it directly onto the trays. If you're using any kind of dehydrator with a heating elements on the top, then put your meats on the top and then you can turn the heat up to 115 and then put your more delicate things on the very, very bottom and uh, fruits and vegetables in the middle. And no, I haven't had any problem with the flavor of the chicken crossing over to my herbs and my fruits and my vegetables when I do that. And then uh, it actually dries up like the ground beef. It can dry up within a, probably about eight to 10 12 hours it's just an assumption and it's also going to depend on how big the pieces are that you put on there but both the dark and the white meat i put on there and then i put it in the jar and then i vacuum seal it using the brake bleeder pump and i have lots of videos showing how i do that i'm not going to be doing that today because i show it in just about every video i'm going to put a link down below to a playlist on the herbs, you know, my dehydrating project so far for 2020. In several of those videos, I show how I use the brake bleeder pump to vacuum seal my jars. You definitely want to make sure you do that with your meats more so than your herbs. Herbs aren't such a big deal to vacuum seal if they're fully dry, but when it comes to your meats, you need to make sure they have get a very good seal. So when I do that, here's a little extra tip that I've started doing. Uh, more recently and that is I pump that brake bleeder up until the needle stops moving. I don't stop at 15 or 20 or whatever. I just keep pumping it up and once the needle stops moving and it can't go any farther, then I take it off. Then I know for sure that seal is going to be tight, especially if you're a lot, if your brake bleeder is old like mine and it's not calibrated anymore, the needle, then uh, it's better just to just keep pumping and, and not worry about what the actual number is and then check it, leave it out for a couple days to make sure it's still sealed. Now I sealed these, it's been what, at least a week since I sealed these up maybe? Well, a couple of them have been at least a week and one of them, the more recent one, whichever one it is, has been several days. And so they're still sealed quite well. And, and then for what I'm gonna plan on using them for, mostly these will be used in anything that's going to have a sauce of some kind, be it chicken fettuccine or chicken enchiladas or even a chicken soup though it's doubtful i'll use it in chicken soup since i already have a bunch canned up but mostly i'm looking at things like that anything with the sauce where i can just throw the dried chicken into the sauce while it's cooking and allow the sauce to rehydrate the chicken that's the easiest way to do it however i'm sure you can rehydrate it by soaking it in some good clean water with maybe some spices added to it uh even maybe throw in a splash of your homemade wine to give it a little extra flavor depending on what it is you're gonna use it in. And also another question I'll know I'll get asked that I probably didn't think to say in that this in that video that'll be coming out is that 
I did not spice the chicken. I didn't add any flavor. The only thing I do is when I go to bake the chicken is I sprinkle some of my homemade seasoned salt across the top of the chicken before it goes in the oven. And if I got potatoes or anything else in the pan, I'll sprinkle it on there too. That's the most for seasoning. For the most part, when I'm doing stuff like this or the ground beef, which I'll go ahead and link to the ground beef video too if you're new and you haven't seen that down below in the description box. By the way, don't forget to click on show more or that little gray arrow that you might see right over here if you're on an iPhone and certain other smart devices. But anyway, uh, I like to leave it fairly plain. I don't like to put a lot of spices into it because if I'm going to use it in fettuccine, I'm going to be using more Italian types herbs and spices in there where if I'm going to use it in an enchilada, I'm going to use herbs and spices that go best in Mexican foods like cumin and chili powder. Where with the Italian, I'd be using more basil, rosemary, and oregano. And so I don't want any conflicting herbs and spices, depending on, now some of those will go good across, all the way across the board, but at any rate, I still like to leave it plain. Let's go ahead and talk about the, the herbs that I have here. Now this is only a small fraction of the many herbs I've been dehydrating. Now, as I mentioned before, I'll be putting that 2020 dehydrating playlist. I did want to just mention these ones because I got a couple that are I finally about done getting the at least one jar filled up and then this is a new one I just started and this these are elder flowers. So my elderberries uh, shrubs are doing really good. Now I realize for a lot of you you're already to the point where you're almost ready to pick your berries. Mine aren't that far yet. I'm only starting to see little green berries starting to form on some clusters. But I've got tons of flowers. Now your elderflowers do have a lot of medicinal benefits that are very similar to the elderberries. And yes, you can use them in your cough, cold, and flu remedies. Now there's going to be some things that your elder that your berries will have such as your high antioxidants because of the dark purple color if you're using the black elderberry. And I'm guessing, I haven't looked it up, it's very likely it might not be as high in vitamin C as the berry. However, it's still incredibly beneficial. So since I get more flowers than I do berries, I think half of that is because of the birds and, and those, the, they're up there tall. I mean, they're past my roof line, even though I cut them about down to three feet this year. I have to climb up on a ladder and then pull it down to be able to cut some of these flowers. So I've been taking the most mature flower clusters and then just pulling the flowers off the stems and putting them on the dehydrator trays, as you can see in the pictures here, and then dehydrating them up. Now it's important that you get as much of the stems out of there as you possibly can. You don't have to get it all out before you dehydrate, though I do try to get most of them out. But then once the flowers are totally dehydrated, you might find it a little bit easier to finish getting the, the stems out, the little tiny stems out because it said the leaves and the stems are toxic and you don't want to consume those. And then some of the other things, uh, I just topped off this jar of nasturtium flowers. I'm going to be dehydrating up more. I have, and by the way, I'm not going to go into all the things I'm using this stuff for. I have videos on most of the herbs I'm talking about here, uh, profiles. So I'm also going to link to the video playlist where I have all the different profiles of the individual herbs. What I've done so far, I still have a lot more to do. But anyway, pansy flowers, lavender flowers, calendula, the honeysuckle, which is a new thing this year, red clover, my first jar for this year of nasturtium leaves. I'll be vacuum sealing them and putting them back into storage for medicinal use, for use in making my infused oils for skin cream, for salves, or for making uh, cough, cold, and flu medicine, or making medicinal extracts like I'm going to be doing with the nasturtium leaves. So again, check out those videos so you can see what all I use those for. I know I have one on this nasturtium where I talk about nasturtium leaves and flowers and how I use them. All right, well, I think that's it for my food preservation projects for this week. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video and it gives you some ideas of either new ways or different ways to do things or new things to put up. Oh yes, and don't forget to share with us down below what you're preserving this week and how you're preserving it. All right, well, thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.